Ready? Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's special presentation. My name is Virginia, and I'm the Education Coordinator here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve and your host for this evening's event. Before we get started, I'd like to um, say a special thank you to the California Humanities for their generous support of this evening's event and the new exhibit that we will unveil later tonight. California Humanities is a partner of the National Humanities, National Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight, we acknowledge the rich history of these lands and waterways. We acknowledge the people who have lived and made a living here for thousands of years and continue to do so today. And we acknowledge the traditional lands and territories of the Kalenduric, the indigenous people of the Elkhorn Slough. Thank you. This evening's presentation and the new exhibit is the culmination of more than a year long effort to organize and present the rich history of the Elkhorn Slough and its watershed. We will begin this evening with a presentation by Andrea Wolfuck, our reserve um, stewardship coordinator. During her many years of researching the historical ecology of this region, Andrea became enamored with the intricate interrelation between the cultural history and the ecological history. This weaving of human action and nature is what was the inspiration behind this new exhibit, Woven in Time. Tonight, Andrea will share her journey and the enormous task she undertook to organize literally 8,000 years of history into our new interactive timeline. We will also hear about her research and some of the stories that have emerged over the years. So at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Andrea. So I'll be passing the baton and she's gonna unmute herself and take over. Thank you for that, Virginia. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. It'll be about a 20 minute uh, presentation. Give me just a second to get this going. There we go. Okay. So before we jump in, I wanted to explain why a land manager or stewardship coordinator is talking to you about history, especially a land manager who thought history was a super boring topic in high school and college. I was trained in biology and ecology, but when I got the job at Elkhorn Slough 21 years ago, my task was to restore natural habitats on land that had been in dairy for many, many decades. To understand what that meant to restore land, I needed to understand what the land and water had been in the past, and I needed to understand how those things had changed in the last 200 years and what was possible going, future, going into the future. It could have been a quick history review, but once I started researching the land's history, I couldn't stop. How people interacted with the place over the last 8,000 years was endlessly fascinating. And despite earlier work, it was still a bit of a mystery. Um, I started in the early 2000s, and that's about when the internet was opening up new avenues for discovering old information. And I was completely hooked. Studying um, the past has profoundly shaped the way I view our estuary and the uplands around it and our relationship to those habitats. It has been life-changing for me and I'm excited to share at least a little bit of it with you tonight. So as we start out here, I'd like to give you a taste of our new history kiosk. Let's start with the format. Here's one of the earliest slides in our series. This is what the screen is going to look like. The top yellow bar up here will have our chapter title, and that's what our story is and what time period are we in. On the right is an orange bar with the theme for the slide. And on the bottom is where the action really is. We'll have um, photos or films, interactive maps, audio, coupled with some text that explains what you're seeing. So in our kiosk, we start about 8,000 years ago and we continue right on up until today. So let's talk about this orange header just a little bit, these themes as I'm calling them. And um, throughout the kiosk, we have four main themes. The first one is an overview. So for any chapter or time period, you get, a, you get kind of a small summary of what we'll be discussing in the following slides. 
that's followed by stories about people and their culture. Then stories about the land and water, or maybe sometimes plants and animals as well. And then finally, how people and interacted with the land and water around them to make a living. So the kiosk has a consistent and repeating format. But to see our story in this framework, you'll have to visit the reserve when the visitor center is open again to the public, or I understand we might be posting this online and then you could visit uh, some of the kiosk content and this format then online. But for the rest of this talk, I'm going to abandon these design elements. Um, the rest of my talk is gonna be a small sampler of the content in the kiosk, but without the nice orange boxes spelling out these uh, four themes for you. It's gonna be a quick sprint through time, a small slice of what the kiosk has to share. So I've got about maybe 15 more minutes and we'll cover 8,000 years. All right, so let's jump in. If we begin 8,000 years ago, the land and water were quite different then. So this is the world as it appears today, Monterey Bay with Elkhorn Slough in the middle. And this is what we think it looked like 8,000 years ago. The world had been coming out of the last glacial period for a few thousand years by then, and geologists have found that rising sea levels at that point were really covering a lot of ground in our local valleys. Our estuaries were enormous, and look at how big the Salinas River seems to have been. Elkhorn Slough looks pregnant with this big bulge in the middle, and then the Pajaro River also appears to have been very, very large. Later, sediment would fill in a lot of that open water area, making the waterways smaller, thinner, like you saw earlier in my previous slide. And the coastline would get pushed to the a bit more to the east. So here you can see the coastline was still a little farther to the west and today it's where this dashed line is. People arrived in this region about then or maybe even a couple of thousand years earlier. This place would change as climate changed and people managed the world around them. Of course I think a lot of people now recognize the California Indians managed a lot of land uh, often through fire. So the people in the place would dramatically affect each other. So California Indians have been living in North Monterey County continuously for at least 8,000 years. And storytelling can be a powerful link between that deep past and today. Our local PBS station and Val Lopez from the nearby Ama Mutsun tribe have kindly allowed us to share their video of Val reading an Ohlone story linked to our region to give us a sense of people and culture. The kiosk includes that video, but because videos often fail in online talks, I decided not to show it, but I extracted about one minute as an audio clip. So when we did a practice talk, it's, it, was a little, it, was, it was a little hard to hear. So you might wanna turn your speakers up right now or maybe put your ear a little closer to your speakers. I'll, let me try to make sure I've got my, speak, my microphone up as much as I can. And uh, let's listen to the story together. I'm going to read the story how hummingbirds got fire and this is a story um, that applies to, to Ohlone. Eagle, hummingbird, crow, raven, and hawk were hungry. There was food to be found but he needed fire to cook it. The eagle sent hummingbird to get fire from the badger people underground. But the badger people refused to share their fire and sent Hummingbird away. When Hummingbird returned, Eagle was very angry and sent him back. The badger people saw Hummingbird coming and said, Cover the fire! Cover the fire! They hid the fire and covered it with a deer skin. But the deer skin had a hole in it where an arrow had gone through. And Hummingbird reached in with his long, narrow beak. He took out a hot ember and carried it along. But before he could put it safely into his armpit, it flamed, turning his throat a brilliant red. That's why Hummingbird has a red throat, and that's how there came to be fire in the world again. So for that, the Mutsun honored the Hummingbird by having it be our our, our tribal symbol of today. So how do you sum up 8,000 years of people in place in four chaos slides? How do you do it justice? It would take 
hundreds or thousands of slides. And so I'm just going to acknowledge that um, from that period, we jump forward um, into the 1500s and 1600s when the first written accounts of our area were published. So here I'm going to read a short uh, translated excerpt from a priest journal when his Spanish expedition, the Vizcano expedition, briefly landed at Monterey in December of 1602. And we'll read it together. Uh, this is what he described at their camp in Monterey. Oh, I need to move this over. Among the animals, there are large fierce bears and other animals called elks from which California Indians make elk leather jackets. On the beach was a dead whale and at night some bears came to feed on it. There are many fish here and a great variety of mollusks among the rocks. Among them, there were certain barnacles or large shells fastened to the lo lowest part of the rocks. The Indians hunt for them to extract from them their contents to eat. All along this coast, there's a great abundance of sea wolves or dogs. The Indians clothe themselves in the skins of these animals, which are healthful, fine, beautiful, and convenient. So for a couple of hundred years, the Spanish would sail by Monterey and Elkhorn Slough and their galleons as part of the trade between Mexico and the Philippines. But other than that Vizcaino expedition, they rarely stopped. It wasn't until 1770 that the Spanish actually expanded into Upper California, founding the Monterey Presidio and Carmel Mission just about 250 years ago. They were small settlements, but the changes they brought to the tribes in this place were enormous and the beginning of more changes to come. And I think that in the foreground of this 1792 drawing of the Monterey Peninsula, a presidio, you get a flavor of some of that change. I think what we're seeing here are local Indian men doing maybe forced labor for the presidio. One of the things that I did specifically for the history kiosk to get a better vision of who lived in our area was to go through official census data. The first re record keeping was done by the Spanish priests. They kept records of the local Indians who were moved from their villages into the missions. The Huntington Library has digitized those records and they are searchable online. So you can look up local tribe names to see who came into which mi mission, who they came in with, how old they were, and the date of their death. The tribe name for the people living along the coast around the Salinas River, around Elkhorn Slough, and up to the Pajaro was, and I hope I'm saying this right, is Kalantaruk. Between the years 18, seven, sorry, 1783 and 1806, Spanish priests recorded the movement of 100 of Kalantaruk members from their home near Elkhorn Slough into the San Carlos or Carmel and San Juan Batista missions. And as you go through their records and you can see the date they came in and the date of their death, it becomes uh, evident pretty quickly that over 30% of those people died within five years of entering a mission. It was a very difficult and by most accounts, an awful life. But of course, some people did make it through. On a more hopeful note, in the kiosk, you'll see uh, today's Mutsun's uh, approach to engaging with the land today. And that's a great reason to visit our kiosk when it's open or to visit it online. All right, so the mission system really changed who and what occupied a lot of North Monterey County land. Cattle were introduced and multiplied quickly. There were a lot of them in this area, changing plant and animal communities. By 1821, the Spanish government was replaced by Mexican control and the era of large ranchos began. A Mexican citizen could ask the new government for a land grant, and to get that grant, they had to submit a map and a description of the land and water they were requesting. The quirky hand-drawn maps that they drew are a window into this place in the 1830s and 1840s. So if you've been to one of my talks before, you've probably seen some version of this rancho map. This rancho belonged to the Castro family and it was called the Bolsa Nuevo y Moro Cojo. This map was drawn in the 1840s and it has some great details. On the left, there are three large esteros or estuaries and they represent the estuaries you probably know, Elkhorn Slough at the top, Moro Cojo in the middle and the Tembladero Slough. 
Uh, these estuaries are and were connected by uh, the lower Salinas River, the Rio here. And they appear to have had a shared mouth to the ocean, which in this drawing is drawn actually in line with Moro Coho Slough. If you look on the right side, you can see the San Miguel Canyon. And if you look really closely, you can see lakes and streams drawn throughout the canyon and its feeder valleys. Surrounding the canyon is Chamisal on both sides, or Chaparral, uh, which really is shown throughout the hilly region uh, between the canyon and uh, our estuaries. But the Mexican era was pretty short-lived. By the mid-1800s, the gold rush brought people from all over the world to California. California became a state and the big Mexican ranches began to be broken up. And that's really clear in this 1877 map. This is uh, the same area you just saw in that uh, rancho map. It's the Bolsa Nuevo y Moro Cojo Rancho with Elkhorn Slough shown up here, Moro Cojo here and Tembladero again and the, the Salinas River running along the coast. But now you can see the new subdivisions being sold off by the Castro family to American newcomers. Another big change, that shared mouth, which had been drawn right about here in the previous map, is now north of Elkhorn Slough. If you look closely, you'll see the Parson House on land that belongs to the Elkhorn Slough Reserve today, and that's how Parson Slough, which is one of the biggest tidal creeks on the reserve, got its name. If you also look just a little to the west of that on land that is also partially owned by the reserve today, you will see it was owned by the Millers. The first owner was Hester Miller, and Hester has given uh, her name to our big salt marsh restoration project that we're doing on a uh, part of that parcel now. In the late 1800s, farming became a foundation of the local economy, and I love this photo. Uh, it was uh, given to us by a local family, the Vieira family, uh, showing their land near uh, Moss Landing in Elkhorn Slough. And because of the new farming, farmers needed a way to get their products to market. In the 1860s, shipping became very important in and around Elkhorn Slough. Ships would come in that shared mouth that I just showed you. Um, to get up the sloughs or estuaries, and then they would get to warehouses that were along the shorelines to load up with grain and produce, and then they would take it back out, that shared mouth, and take it to San Francisco and other markets. They would go up Elkhorn Slough, which is shown here in the foreground, and if they would go all the way up, they would end up at the warehouses at a place called Hudson's Landing. Um, and then they also could go all the way into Moro Coho Slough where there are warehouses um, for storing and delivering as well. Other ships stayed outside of the sloughs using Charles Moss's landing along the coast instead. But in 1872, things changed again and the train and the railroad came to town which you can see way in the background there. And the train ended up being a better way to move produce to market. Once again, I looked at the local census records to get a sense of who lived around Elkhorn Slough in the late 1800s. And even though local historian Sandy Leiden has written books about this, I'm gonna confess that I was surprised at how many Chinese men lived in the area. Um, I knew that they'd been instrumental in building the railroad tracks that you see there in the background. But it turns out they were also so important in helping build the agricultural economy here too. Here's a close close up of an 1892 map showing that Castroville's Chinatown was at the corner of McDougal and Spiegel. And I don't know if you can make out these small words, Chinatown right across the top there. So that location is just two blocks away from the church, which might be shown right there, where this stunning painting hangs today. Because the ships weren't so important by the early 1900s, the trains were moving things. Uh, locals began eyeing local estuaries, the, the tidal channels and the marshes for other uses. And in a lot of cases that meant blocking out tides and converting the estuary wetlands to different habitats. Here are two examples from today's Elkhorn Slough Reserve. On the left, we see Mrs. Hauer 
um, hunting on the Empire Gun Club uh, that made up quite a bit of what is today's reserve. And the Empire Gun Club had converted some, some salt marshes to freshwater duck ponds for hunting while they were here in the early 1900s. Later, the Elkhorn Farm ended up uh, owning a lot of the land that is now the reserve. And the Elkhorn Farm converted a lot of um, salt marshes, really large tracts of them, to dry pasture for the pat cattle that they, of course, had. And because a lot of people diked and drained a lot of the tidal wetlands and channels in our area, little changes started to add up. Let's step back to the mid 1800s for just a minute. Remember that Rancho map that I just showed you with all the American parcels in the shared mouth uh, north of Elkhorn Slough? This map that I have up here is a close up. It's a survey, a close up survey of that. So what you can see here is that shared mouth right here. And you can see uh, the lower part, the entrance to Elkhorn Slough. You can see Moss's Landing with that wharf jutting out here. Also drawn in this beautiful survey are tide lines, these kind of faint lines that go through these channels. So you can see that there was a fairly wide mouth and a deep enough channel for ships to get in and out of the Lower Salinas and Elkhorn Slough and even into to Moro Coho. Um, but as people began to drain a lot of the tidal Martian creeks, less water had to move in and out of this mouth on any given tide. And so the water could move slower and it did indeed begin to move slower. It became sluggish and the sediment that was in the water began to drop out, filling some of the channels. And that's really evident in this uh, 1926 map. Um, see all the islands that had formed? By that time, ships could no longer easily navigate into the sloughs anymore. And you can see the mouth is much narrower. The mouth actually during this period began to close much more frequently than it had in the past. Back in the 1860s during this period, the mouth, this big shared mouth would move around a bit, but it would only close for maybe a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks at a time. And that was always in the winter. It was open most of the time. But by this period, it started to close pretty frequently and you could get water backing up behind that and it did flood the little town of Moss Atlantic particularly badly in uh, 1940. And because of that, the loss of shipping and local flooding due, due to mouth closure, the Moss Landing Harbor Mouth was created in 1946. And I think this image is from 1947, actually. Uh, uh, locals uh, worked with the Army Corps to have the Army Corps dredge a deep and permanent mouth in line with Elkhorn Slough, and it was uh, really set up permanently with these jetties off to the side. So here would have been the old mouth, and here's the new mouth in line with Elkhorn Slough there. So, and then uh, accompanying that, uh, they used the old Salinas River Channel to turn it into a harbor. Now a lot of tidal water moved straight into Elkhorn Slough, maybe more than had in the 1800s, and it certainly stopped being a sluggish backwater and became very highly energetic and tidal. And because of that new mouth and the harbor, heavy industry uh, could move into the Moss Landing area. And that's really demonstrated very well from this photo from I think the 1950s. You can see it, here's the South Harbor with uh, boats in here. This is the Kaiser Refractory. And then you get just a little peek at the PG&E plant, which of course is still there today. But people's attitude about land and water began to change in the late 1900s. The environmental movement really took hold here and really all across the country. And how did that manifest itself here? Well, scientists started measuring troubling air and water pollution. And in fact, in the Elkhorn Slough and Moss Landing, the water was too polluted for people to eat shellfish. And certainly people had been eating shellfish for thousands of years. So that was a big change that people were starting to document. Citizens began to push back against some large developments. Glenn Church just wrote apparently a very fascinating book all about humble oil and how it was stopped in its tracks in, in Moss Island. I believe he's actually gonna give a talk uh, in January too. I'm sure that's gonna be worth seeing. And 
move this out of the way so I can read it, private and public organizations started to buy conservation lands in larger numbers. And here's a neat ad from the 1970s encouraging people to give to the Nature Conservancy to help save Elkhorn Slough. And they did indeed buy uh, land and marshes in Elkhorn Slough as part of this uh, effort. And because of that, because of the renewed interest and uh, renewed interest particularly by uh, public and private organizations, the federal government, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, teamed up with the state of California and Department of Fish and Game then, Wildlife Now, and the newly formed nonprofit Elkhorn Slough Foundation to establish the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve just about 40 years ago now. The Elkhorn Slough Reserve was one of the first national estuarine research reserves in the country, but today that network includes 29 or 30 research reserves. It's growing so quickly, I can never remember where we're at, but we've got about 29 or 30 of them around the United States today. And each one of those reserves practices and promotes stewardship of coasts and estuaries through research, education, and training. And those are the pillars that really hold up the reserve here today. And the reserve has opened up a new way for people to interact with the land and water in Elkhorn Slough. People on uh, the reserve stress land management for the benefit of native plants and animals, for the public to enjoy them, and scientists and students to learn. And uh, on the left-hand picture, this is the first reserve manager uh, back in the 1980s, Ken Moore, dealing with what looks like some downed Monterey pine. And the picture on the right is much more recent. These are our uh, current researchers working on restoration science to figure out the best way to restore native oysters uh, in our estuary. So this interplay, this connection between the people and land continues. Of course, it always will. But I think that we're at a really good place in time right now, even though it is, okay, 2020. And I think looking forward, we hope that people continue to work to protect and deepen our connection to this land and water. And thank you so much for letting me share this story. I'm always excited to, to talk to people about it. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share and hand it back Great. to you, Virginia. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea, so much. I mean, you've really done a great job of capturing the amazing journey um, that was undertaken to begin this process, the research that you did, which was unbelievable. And, um, and just the way this kiosk has come together and the layout of it and what we are really excited to be able to share with folks this evening and into the future. So real quickly though, we did have one question in the comments box. So I'm gonna throw that back at you. Okay. And the question, and I'm paraphrasing, is, uh -huh. is there a relationship between our Monterey Bay Deep Sea Canyon and the Elkhorn Slough. Yes, and am I the best person? Okay. So that that's true today. So they, I guess maybe they're asking about the formation. I think that they line up so beautifully. I would, you would need a geologist to really tell you, but I think that there is definitely some belief that the canyon is related to the drainage that is Elkhorn Slough. As, and, but the canyon has gotten much, much deeper, I think, because of turbidity flows. And I have not taken a marine geology course in probably 25 years. So I'm probably, <laughs> probably not giving you the full answer, but I would say yes, and talk to a geologist to get the full answer. All right, great. Thank you so much. I know that's one that we we hear often um, that relationship because boy, the, the 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 water around here so defines this whole region and the definitely the interconnectedness between one waterway and another. And you certainly share that with our connection with the Salinas River over time and um, and the other sloughs. So again, thank you so much. Um, we have another presenter this evening, and I'm really excited. Um, to introduce Rose Bondurant. So Rose is our, has been our assistant on this project and Rose was instrumental in organizing a lot of the modern day stories and also most importantly, crossing the T's and dotting the I's on this project. So um, Rose is going to share a few of her fun aha moments and a favorite story. So again, I'm gonna pass the baton. Rose, if you would like to unmute yourself and share your, and I'm going to meet. 
All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Virginia mentioned, I joined this project later in the game than everyone else, and I thought I'd share a little bit about my journey um, with this project. <clears throat> as a child growing up on acreage in gold country, I would spend much of my time looking under rocks, climbing trees, and filling my pockets with treasures. So when my family would visit Pacific Grove, Monterey, Moss Landing, and Santa Cruz every summer, we would fill our time with hiking, kayaking, and my absolute favorite, tide pooling. The longer I sat at the edge of the pools, the more I saw, feeling like Horton watching entire worlds opening up in spaces no bigger than my palm. These micro communities, teeming with life so very different from my own, inspired my lifelong love affair with ecology and my path toward a natural resources degree from Humboldt State University. Despite being captivated by the magic of the redwoods, I still felt called to find my way to Monterey. Through a long and winding journey, I found an opportunity to join this team at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve late last year. As I grappled with finding housing in a new town, I hit the ground running, assisting with school programs and leading the Estuary Explorers Club. However, my background in graphic design brought me into the kiosk development as a catalyst to help stitch the story together seamlessly and to pay attention to the pesky details like those orange boxes and the dang S's on the dates. Though I am hardly a history buff, I had blown through most of Steinbeck and Ricketts's work before the age of 15, so I was delighted to delve even deeper into knowing this area that I fell in love with as a child. As the county and country went into lockdown, my focus shifted from educational offerings into kiosk development and only kiosk development. My wishes had been answered in the typical twisted way the universe likes to answer one's call. I found myself consuming research and opinion articles, casually conversing about little known tidbits over wine with locals, and digging through dusty boxes stuffed with newspaper clippings. Each bit of information I collected, an interview I conducted, highlighted that the community that built and continues this slew story views humans and nature as intrinsically connected. The strength of our community comes from an understanding of where we come from, an agreement that our slew shapes and impacts us just as much as we do it, and a constant communication about where we are going. And I feel very honored to have become yet another strand woven into the fabric of the Reserve family and the Slew's story. Thank you, Rose. And you have become an integral part and we are so glad to have you as part of our team. And guess what? We're ready to cut some ribbon, aren't we? So come on over and join me, all right? All right, so while we wait for Rose to make her way over here to the visitor center, um, and we've got our scissors ready to, to cut some ribbon, I wanna take care of a little bit of housekeeping. So two things to think about. One is, if you have not said hello yet in the, in the comments box, please do so. We really wanna know, we're really excited to see who was joining us this evening. So please put your name in, drop a comment, um, tell us your favorite story um, in that comment box. And lastly, at the end of the presentation, or actually right now, we're gonna drop into the comment box a survey about your experience with this evening's event. And we would greatly appreciate if after the presentation, you would take five short minutes to answer just a few questions um, about, again, your experience with this event this evening. And um, we thank you very much. So Rose is making her way over here. There's Rose, we're doing our physically distanced um, interaction here um, in this virtual world. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this exhibit really came out of a desire to capture and share the rich cultural and ecological history of this place with our friends, with our fans, with our visitors. We hope to create an exhibit that would be informative and fun, full of stories presented for you through video, through narration, through images. It is the culmination of years of work as you've seen. 
It is the culmination, the collaboration of um, a small cadre of volunteers who spent hours um, interviewing and culling through articles and things over a, a number of years. Um, and with a, some financial support um, from a funder, the Santa Cruz Museum of Art has supported that particular group. And we are just incredibly grateful to these folks, as well as the staff that participated in helping us pull some last minute pieces together. And um, so again, a big shout out to the enormous team that helped to do it. And also a really special thank you um, for the support of the Amamutsin uh, tribe. Uh, they were integral in helping us pull a lot of the wonderful indigenous stories of this place and really could not have um, been able to do justice to that without their support. So a great big thank you to, to our, our, our locals. Um, so with that, I think we are ready and you've got your scissors. We have our scissors. We are going to cut the ribbon. So uh, you want to, ready, here we go, Rose. And now we are ready. So here's our opening. I'm touching the screen and we've got, we're gonna zip over to the 1900s. And we nicely, it comes through the various stories. And yay, it's working and we are so excited. Beautiful images, beautiful, beautiful images. And here's the thing. Oh, I wish so much that we could have all of you come in over the next couple of weeks um, to show up and to begin interacting with this beautiful new exhibit that we are so incredibly proud of. I mean, we were literally dancing last night as we, we hit the on button, um, but we know we can't do that. We know that right now uh, we all have to be patient and we all have to wait. And so we are gonna wait patiently for the time when all of you can come back and join us um, here in the visitor center and visit this brand new beautiful exhibit. In the meantime, I can share with you that our trails are open and you're welcome to come and, and hike the trails on, our, on the times that we are um, open. We are hoping to, uh, I think Andrea mentioned it, get this content up onto our website. Um, it may not be as interactive, but the content will be there. And so you'll have an opportunity and maybe checking back in in the next couple of weeks on our website to see that we've got it up and you can start exploring it. Um, and then just wait with us to get in here to actually start um, listening to the sound and looking at these beautiful images that we've been able to pull together. So um, again, um, we're waiting to have you back in here 100%. And um, we really want to, at this point, just say thank you. Thank you for joining us for this evening. Thank you for your endless support of the work that we do here on so many levels. And what we would like to do is please say, take care of yourself, take care of your loved ones, and blessings from all of us here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>